Hello? Hello. Whoa, whoa. Good evening. If everybody could take their seat, we're going to start the program here. So, hey guys. while you take your seat, I'll start the introduction. Um, I am a Jack Garamendi. I'm the chair of the Calaveras County Board of Supervisors. I'd like to welcome everybody to San Andreas tonight. Um, thank you so much. I want to introduce a few uh, of my fellow board members. Uh, Supervisor Ben Stopper is there in the back. Uh, Supervisor Marita Calloway was running right there. Did I miss any of my other supervisors? All right. Well, I want to welcome you all here tonight. Um, this, is a, this is an exciting day for Calaveras County. Having the Insurance Commissioner for the State of California come up and talk to us about some of the challenges that we're facing. This meeting originated uh, really through volunteer efforts. One of our board members for West Point Fire, Greg Pryor, reached out to the Department of Insurance uh, with some friends from Amador County, and we went down and met with the Insurance Commissioner and talked about some of the issues that are facing our county in particular, although it impacts all over the state of California, insurance. So we went down, we talked, and we invited the insurance commissioner to come up and meet with our citizens, which he graciously has done. Um, this is an issue that impacts our community in so many ways. Uh, if you can't get insurance, you can't buy or sell a home. It impacts us uh, when, rates, when insurance companies cancel their policies and our rates go up. It, takes, it hurts our businesses who can't get insurance. It goes on and on and on, and it's something that we in this community are dealing with every day. I'm very happy to see so many representatives from fire here today, Cal Fire, our local fire departments, who are really being active partners in helping make a safer community for, for Calaveras. But this is a Department of Insurance show tonight, and it is my great privilege and honor to recognize the state's insurance commissioner, uh, Commissioner Lara. He comes from Southern California, but he's been doing a lot of time up here in the foothills and to know some of our issues. So the way the program is going to run is the commissioner will give a presentation. He's got a panel that will give a presentation as well. Then we're going to have questions and answers. Um, I think it's really important that the insurance commissioner understand the issues that are facing our community. I would ask everybody to do their county proud. There's no reason to hold a punch, but we can deliver it with some class. So let's, um, let's um, have an organized meeting and be respectful and listen to the insurance commissioner. And maybe he doesn't want that, but that's how we do things up here. Right. So insurance commissioner, Thank welcome you. to Calaveras County. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, supervisor, and to the other supervisors that are here. Um, really, this is a, a unique opportunity for us. This is the first time that the insurance department is coming actually out to the communities that have been affected uh, from non-renewals and from wildfires. And the idea really came about the fact that after several conversations that we've had with several of our rural counties, uh, that many of you did not know, one, that we existed, two, that the services that we offer and the availability that we can help our, our consumers and our constituents. And so I said, you know, we need to get out of LA and get out of Sacramento and actually come and have these conversations with our constituents who are uh, suffering from the aftermath of these fires uh, when it comes to non-renewal of insurance and having to also work throughout your issues with the claims. And so before I begin the presentation, I wanna take a moment to have my staff that are here from the various outreach departments, if they can raise their hand uh, so that, oh, there they are with the nifty, uh, blue polos, and we brought them because we want you to uh, have the opportunity that if you have a specific question, a specific issue, or a claim that you want to open, we want you to have the opportunity to meet one-on-one -on -one with our staff, uh, and you could do that throughout the presentation tonight, uh, and we want to make sure that they're available for you and that we follow up with your specific question that you might have to deal with your maybe specific claim or specific issue uh, in a way that protects your privacy. Uh, and so we, we have them available for you. So at any moment uh, you feel you need to have a conversation with them, they're there for you uh, to assist you as well and help you through uh, an issue 
that you might have. I also want to take a moment to thank Cal Fire, who's always been here, and all our, our fire uh, leaders and community. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce, who was grateful as well. We met with them before. Uh, and then also, again, just want to thank you, the residents of Calaveras County. This is uh, my second or third time out here, and truly, it's God's country, and I want to keep it that way. I want to make sure you have an opportunity to continue to live and thrive, and our businesses to continue to, to thrive in these communities. And so what we've done is compiled, I have been in office uh, roughly now seven, seven months, and we've been compiling all this data from rural counties and throughout the entire state, because this is an issue that is affecting all of California. Just ask folks in Oakland, ask folks in San Diego, in Santa Barbara, in LA County, in Riverside. This is an issue that is continuing to grow in, in the state. And where it's happening, we know it is decimating communities. Because we know the trickle down effect of what happens when you cannot find insurance for your property. It devastates the real estate market. It devastates the economic impact of our businesses. If our businesses cannot find insurance, an insurance product to meet their needs. And ultimately, it ends up affecting the valuation of your property and your business, which means less tax dollars for our local governments, which again is already hindering all very low income rural communities and counties. So we understand that this is a trickle effect that's happening. And it's not just affecting homeowners, it's affecting our businesses, it's affecting the way our municipal governments receive resources, and which then in terms allow their local fire departments to have the resources they need uh, to be able to uh, curtail these fires and allow us to continue to fight this ever-changing climate of ours. Uh, in, in terms of extreme heat. So what you're gonna see is a presentation of uh, some data that we've compiled. And a, a lot, some of this is stuff that you already know, but I wanted to just err on, on the fact that we wanna put this out there so folks that are watching through um, the live feed or through the, the, the TV to make sure that they also get this information, which is also clear for uh, what we'll do, we'll have a panel where we're gonna be taking your questions and taking your, the issues that you've been experiencing because we're compiling all that again as we continue to work on finding solutions. So California in 2018 was, 2018 was the most destructive in California's history. We've had the most life lost, the most acres burned, and the most structural damage in 2018 in California's history. Uh, as we know, as the risk increases, the cost of insurance increases, and the availability of coverage also uh, decreases. Uh, insurance companies, and what is harming us the most, is that insurance companies consider the very recent past to underwrite uh, and to determine rates for, er for the near future. And so if we look at the near future, and we just look at 2017 and 2018, that's been a total of $25 billion dollars in losses uh, in terms of the industry. So Calaver, these are some numbers specific to Calaveras County and, and some trends that we're seeing. Since the Butte fire in 2015, which we know resulted in two deaths, 877 structures lost, close to 300 million in losses, that the lack of available insurance is fewer homes are being insured by traditional insurance companies. You know that. Uh, Non-renewals, we've had in, according to our data from the insurance companies, uh, 518 non-renewals last year by insurance companies, and we expect many more because the data does not reflect the 2019 uh, fire season. Uh, we know that there's been a 380% growth since 2015 uh, in the FAIR plan, and we also know that it is not a comprehensive plan, and that the FAIR plan is anything but FAIR. Uh, so we want to look at residential insurance, uh, residential underwriting, and I call it no, new school, old school. Old school, you would have somebody come to your house, review what you've done, and look and inspect the home hardening of your specific dwelling, uh, and, and look at the characteristics around the home before they would determine if they would write. Now, the new school way is you have to even, you have to go through, uh, uh, an evaluation filter that's based on satellite imagery, which we know doesn't really necessarily talk, look at 
what you've done in your individual property or your business to protect it, uh, which is unfortunate because they only look at the, fil the filters based through and looks at uh, evaluate slope, fuel load, and the type of fuel and access. First, you have to get to that to be able to get a policy. And so we have some ideas of what we want to do to be able to uh, verify this, this imagery and, and this data that they're utilizing, which we currently don't have authority to do. So what we've done uh, over the last year in terms of strengthening laws for our non-renewal, uh, for non-renewal laws, last year the legislature passed and the governor signed two bills, one uh, by Senator Dodd that would essentially say a minimum of two annual renewals required for those with total loss uh, and increase that from one. So we added an additional year. Uh, at the time I was in the Senate and did legislation uh, to make sure that we did a one year uh, covered, continuance, co continued coverage for homes in areas within, within or adjacent to wildfire. We were seeing that people were getting dropped even if you, had a, if you did not have a total loss. And we wanted to give for those folks an additional year protection. And we also are working on uh, ensuring that insurance companies should provide more notice than the current 45 days. It is not enough time. 45 days does not make sense for us. It might have made sense before this convergence of different issues with extreme heat, fires, um, uh, this, the wet weather. But now we know 45 days is essentially ridiculous. It's not enough time to give people options to figure out what they're going to do once they get a non-renewal notice. Uh, again, we'll revisit that a little later. So what we've been pretty much compiling is things that you already know. Under insurance and non-renewal issues continue. 45 days notice of, of, of for non-renewal seems completely unfair. It does not take into consideration your individual tenure or your claims history. Many of you have told us, I've been with my insurance company for 30 years, and all of a sudden now I get dropped without uh, any essential conversation or uh, having anybody come and look at the property. There, even if you've had no, uh, there's no consideration to your pre-fire mitigation. Many of you have said, I've done the home hardening, I've done what you've asked, and I'm still getting dropped. Uh, and even if there's no change to your individual risk, people are still getting dropped and non-renewed from their coverage. Uh, and the big one here is the, the, the third uh, data point here, which is there's no clear statewide, statewide mitigation standards that the state can then come in and say, okay, we've all agreed that these are the mitigation standards that we agree as a state so that we can be proactive as a state to make sure that we keep the emitted market here. What currently exists is county level, community and municipal level type of programs that are not married to what the state's doing. And this you're still getting, people are still getting non-renewed. So it is the onerous on the state to come up with some statewide mitigation standards that brings our experts, our first responders, our fire departments, our local communities and the insurance industry to come and come up and get together and create some statewide standards so that we can all work from the same document. So that the insurance companies are now part of the decision in terms of what are the standards and mitigations that they want to see. And this is what we're working on. Uh, and we also understand that many people uh, in these communities are on fixed incomes. Many of our seniors there's this misconception out there that somehow all these are, you know, million dollar homes in Malibu, in Tahoe. We know that the reality is that many of our folks living in our communities, in our rural communities, foothill communities, are on fixed incomes. Many of them have been pushed from the urban core. Many of them are retired and did not foreshadow what's happening now. And so, one, not only do you cannot afford, you, do you not afford the mitigation standards that were, that, the upgrades that we're asking for? So many of our seniors are disabled that can't do that themselves. And so we need to figure out a way to figure out how do we get one insurance cover to cover these upgrades that we want and also try to figure out programs that allow us to continue to provide the resources so that you can do the upgrades that you need. 
Uh, and so, uh, and we also understand what is happening is inaccurate coverage A, which means is your dwelling portion of your home coverage, is really leading to underinsurance, which is a big problem around the state. Many people uh, assume that they're paying their coverage A, but yet there is no um, conversation with the, with the insurance agent when it comes to renew your policy. Some of them don't even have, the onerous is all on you to make sure that you update the insurance company on any changes and upgrades that you've made to your dwelling. And we wanna change that. We wanna put some of the onerous on the insurance company to actually say before you approve or renew a policy, you have to come in and have that conversation with the consumer so that they understand what their true cost is. And that we want because we wanna make sure that you understand what your le coverage level is gonna be and then you make that decision. But the owners cannot just be on you calling the insurance company to update them. They need to, they need to have some of that responsibility so that they come in before they renew a contract, have that conversation, look at the property, investigate the property so that they can provide an appropriate assessment so that you know what your true coverage uh, is gonna have to be and then you make that decision. But so many people, uh, time and time again when we meet, do not understand that they are underinsured. And so we wanna make sure that we, uh, we allow for these conversations to happen. So reducing risk through prevention and mitigation, you know this, you've lived this. Uh, we, these are some of the, uh, the key factors that we, we think should be included when we have these conversations. Uh, building code upgrades, fire resistant modifications, land use planning, community-wide abatement, what we call our community-wide mitigation efforts, defensible space, enhanced infrastructure, and wildfires. I just wanted to get that through so you know that we're, we've, we've looked, we've assessed, uh, and we've talked to uh, a lot of the first responders and our fire uh, leadership folks that agree that these are uh, some of the key um, mitigation and prevention standards that we need to make. I want to quickly go through these as well. This is, this is current legislation that has been sent to the governor that addresses some of the issues that we've been talking about and that we've been supportive. I want to highlight SB 190 by Senator Dodd, which uh, asked the state fire marshal to develop model defensible space requirements. Again, this is for our state so that we can have, we can have a starting document in terms of what are going to be defensible requirements that we can bring to the insurance companies. Uh, I also want to highlight uh, SB 295 by Senator McGuire, which, I'm sorry, that one was uh, AB 38 by Senator Wood, I should say, which is a state level fund program to provide financial assistance to homeowners to help pay for the cost of fire hardening their homes. This is what we're, we're trying to come up with different ideas for, different, for, for our variety of, of folks that are gonna need the resources. We've talked about a tax credit. We're talking about a loan forgiveness program. We're talking about a subsidy for our lowest income seniors that can't afford to make these, uh, these upgrades for themselves as well. Uh, uh, Senator Daly uh, Bill AB 1816 increases the days from 45 to 75. We wanna continue to support. We feel uh, that we wanna get 160 days on top of the 45 days. So this bill's getting us to where we wanna get to when it comes to what is an appropriate amount of time that we should give our constituents to make those decisions uh, about once they get non-renewed. Again, building on that 45 days, we, we, that bill is on the governor's desk that gives us 75. We wanna continue to push for more time as well. This is what uh, action that we are taking in the department. Uh, we are going to be unveiling a, an insurance website for people in, with high uh, wildfire risk. This is going to allow for you to shop around. It's going to allow for you to see who else is covering and who else is providing coverage in these areas uh, when it comes to homeowner insurance. We want uh, the insurance companies to notify policyholders of their individual fire risk scores, and we want to allow time for communities to mitigate. Right now, you just give your, they give you your fire line score and they don't even allow you to mitigate or let alone give you any appeals process. We want, we want an appeals process. We want to give you an opportunity 
to mitigate that score and try to lessen that score. That is what we're working on in the department through our regulatory action. We want the fair plan to actually be fair. We want, uh, they've agreed to work with us, they agreed to increase their coverage limits from 1.5 million to 3 million. They're gonna do that uh, uh, next year uh, after we've asked them to do. And we also want the fair plan to provide full homeowners coverage and offer monthly payment plan options. We hear this time and time again for those uh, folks that are in the fair plan. They wanna be able to do this monthly to be able to pay and they actually, we want you, we want them to be a full coverage comprehensive plan. Because what happens, you get sent to the fair plan, then you have to buy all this wraparound in coverage where you end up spending more money on administrative fees because you keep buying different policies. We want, if the fair plan is truly gonna be fair, it has to be a comprehensive plan. So you only need one plan, and that's gonna be the fair plan to provide comprehensive care coverage. So these are insur uh, legislative proposals that we are working on uh, as we continue to have conversations with the governor and the legislature. We want insurance companies to write and renew a home that has been hardened or is located in a wildfire mitigated community. We're not asking them to cover the entire community, but we want you, if, a, if, you, if you as the homeowner have done everything to mitigate your home and you've Part, you're part of the welfare mitigated community that you've got above and beyond that the insurance company has to cover you. They have to provide that coverage because you've done what you've been asked to do. You have done the right thing. We want to continue folks to incentive, be incentivized to do the right thing and harden their home, and that means we're going to guarantee that you get coverage. And uh, that is something we're working on. We want to mandate insurance companies to provide premium discounts to consumers who have hardened their homes, similar to good driving. You know, this exists already. Why not, again, al give the insur allow the insurance companies, uh, or make the insurance companies, I should say, to give you discounts for doing the right thing? This is exactly what we want. We want people to be invested in doing the right thing, and you should be uh, given a, a discount for that. Um, we want to require insurance companies to cover, to cover building code upgrades. We think this makes sense. The building code upgrades should be covered in your policy as we continue to figure out what are the best, uh, what's the best technology, what's the best material, uh, what are the best codes out there to protect you and your family and your property. And we want insurance companies to notify consumers of rate increases of more than 25%, at least 60 days in advance. Give people opportunity to plan or to shop around, quite honestly. This is what, similar, what they do similarly now to commercial policyholders. Well, if it's good for commercial policyholders, it should be good for our consumers as well and give people appropriate notice before they just slap on the, fee, the increase. Again, this is our, our number, uh, and I know the last thing you want to see is another 1-800 number, but we actually have people that are on the phone Monday through Wednesday, answering your questions. Monday through, I say Wednesday? Monday through Friday, answering your questions. And in the, in the small occurrence that you have to leave a message, our callback time to you is roughly two minutes. So we have folks live on the, on the phone, answering your questions, opening your claim if you have a claim, uh, and, and walking you through what your potential options are if you're not renewed or if you have any other question regarding an insurance issue. Uh, and so I wanna thank you for, for, your, for your time. Uh, this PowerPoint, we, we continue to add upon uh, as we continue to meet with more and more communities. Uh, I hope you have saw some of the things that we're doing and we're pushing our regulatory authority. And I'm telling you now, I'm prepared to go to court if I get sued from the insurance companies. I'm prepared to fight the good fight to get these changes that we need done because they make sense. They give you a little more authority and the department more authority to protect your interest as consumers. Uh, and at this point, I want to invite our Deputy Commissioner, uh, Tony Signorelli, who's gonna come up, and our Special Counsel, Joe Lauscher, who are veterans of the department, uh, to 
start the dialogue and the conversation about some of the issues that you're seeing in the community, some of the questions you might have, because uh, we want to be able to collect that data. Uh, and Supervisor, are you going to be up there with us too? Or? Oh, okay, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, uh, and again, allow you to, to interact with us. You have cards to write questions. If you don't want to write the question down and you want to ask it, well, this is your town hall. We want to make sure we hear from you. <clears throat> Sorry, I got a piece of peanut stuck in my throat, of course. Um, and so we'll, we'll take some of the, the written questions. Our staff are going to be walking around to collect your questions. Uh, and if you don't want to write your question, you want to raise your hand, we'll, we'll select you as well. We want to make sure we hear from all of you. Uh, and so thank you again for being here. We really appreciate it. Your input today is critical as we continue to fight uh, and we continue to address this issue of non-renewals in, in your county. So thank you again. So if staff can bring us the questions and we'll start we have one comment. Yeah. And we'll, why don't we start with the some questions from the audience as we read the questions for your answers. Go ahead. Oh, oh okay. Um, we have property from our neighbors who come up close and it's a steep drop. And it's not their responsibility because they're within their hundred foot limit or clearance. But the problem is, is it, it backsides to our property and we've tried to approach them to say, do you want us, would you weed whack it or shall we do it? Because it puts us in danger. And it's not our property, it's, you know, but what, what can be done <laughs> or can there be anything done? Yeah, I, I think this is one where, um, there we go. This is one where you, you, you're asking, you know, my neighbor's property has some issues. How do I resolve those? Because I know those affect my property. And essentially, we have to recommend you either go to your town council or fire department is most likely and ask if they're willing to communicate that need to mitigate to your neighbor. Um, it, you know, your question is great that it points out that you're kind of everybody's in this together and you really are do have to rely on your neighbors to do what they can to their properties in order to protect your property and make insurance uh, more available to you. So I think you try with your local fire department or uh, officials first is what you do and hopefully um, that keeps it on a nice level with your neighbor. We have a we have a question here. Why has California not reviewed and instituted a wildfire partners type of program to assist homeowners uh, work through getting, uh, getting insured or, or something similar? Yeah, and, and that would be the, uh, the Colorado model um, where there is local state participation in subsidizing homeowners to be able to pay the cost of mitigation in, re in return in that county, in Boulder County, it's limited to Boulder County, it's kind of a pilot project, and in return, the insur several insurance companies, five or six or seven, have agreed, once you've gotten a certification uh, from an independent certifier, then you, the insurance company will agree to insure you. So it's a way to get availability in place. Um, it would, it's something we're certainly looking at in California to see, number one, whether it would translate you know, to a large state like this, or what we might try it out in different areas to see if it would work. But we would also need precipitation by the state and, and the local government as to being able to, to, where the funds would come from to subsidize the mitigation and, and then get the certification and get the agreement with the insurance industry. And whether that takes legislation or voluntary agreement on the insurance industry, uh, that those are things we're working on. This didn't happen to me, it happened to one of my neighbors. 
How can an insurance company demand that you remove trees on your neighbor's property and then cancel you because you don't have permission to remove those trees? Yeah, I, I think that's similar actually to the first question that was asked is when the insurer, and it's, it actually points out to a slide the, the commissioner pointed at, that insurers used to underwrite just looking at your own property, but now they're looking at not only adjacent, adjacent properties, but you know any in the vicinity, homes of in the vicinity, and essentially they are saying that those trees pose a risk to your home, and I don't think they're saying that you should remove your neighbor's trees. That's I think exactly what they're saying. Well, th that's inappropriate for them to say, but what they can say is that we won't write that property, your property, while there are these trees that are adjacent to your property. And it is a problem for people who live near state uh, parks for people whose neighbors aren't taking care of their property. I'm not saying your neighbor is necessarily not taking care of their property, but you're underwritten more than you know the border lines of your own property today. But we, what we can do is also actually if we can get the information and if we know the insurance carrier or right. your neighbor's information, we can follow up uh, if that's the case. Yeah, and that is one of the reasons why uh, the commissioner is proposing, a, you know, a community-wide mitigation standard and then a homes hardening standard that if you do that, presumably your neighbor's property would have been mitigated and therefore the insurance companies would then be required to write those homes in those communities. And that's why we're proposing just that. And we'll, we'll get one of the written questions. We're going to do one-on-one, -on -one, one written and one just so that we were fair. Um, this question, uh, there's actually three questions here, but we'll take the, I think the first two. Uh, who determines the fire hazard uh, zones? And the second question is, uh, we have a separate policy for earthquakes, why not for wildfire? Yeah, so fire hazard zones, um, I guess that's, maybe that's more of a general term here, but an insurer determines what are its underwriting rules. So it can determine uh, in terms of fire, whether they, they could use whether you live within a thousand feet of brush, whether you have a wood shingle roof, whether your neighbor's properties pose a risk. Um, many of them, as I think you're all familiar, use wildfire models that assign scores based on algorithms that are intended to measure risk. So in a sense, who sets the fire hazard score or, or determines whether something is too hazardous or not is a decision the insurer makes. And as long as those determinations are based on risk, and not just some bias they might have on age or something else of the individuals, then they have pretty complete discretion to choose what level of risk they're willing to write. Um, so the, the third question was, why are the insurance companies not required to notify the insurance commissioner of non-renewal due to wildfire? We actually require them to do that now they, the numbers we put up there with the 518 non-renewals in the county, we got through that data, and that data is available uh, online, and we can provide this as well countywide. Uh, that was legislation we did to be able to get the exact numbers of the, the non-renewals that are happening and, and where they're happening so that then the department could come in and act quickly. Yeah, and a, a question, oh, I'll just answer one more of this card, I guess. We have a separate policy for earthquake. Why not wildfire? Well, uh, there, I guess there are a few reasons. One is that the way California law currently operates, a policy that covers fire must cover any type of fire, whether it be a kitchen fire or you know, a, a, some other kind of house fire or a wildfire or 
however it's caused, is fire. An insurer actually couldn't choose to exclude wildfire and write only the non-wildfire, in part because it's sometimes hard to determine if something was a wildfire or not. If it doesn't move across many homes. I, I guess to some degree you might say, is this mean should we have a pool for wildfire like we have for earthquake or flood? And that might be possible. For those who maybe have lived in the Bay Area, you know earthquake insurance is actually quite expensive and has a very high deductible, a deductible beyond which they don't really expect to pay, but once in a, I don't know, millennium. Um, and for flood, uh, flood has had a lot of losses. It's a federal government program, and the federal government has subsidized it. There isn't such a subsidy available for wildfire. So it's unfortunate that there aren't such things, but if they were just created, there's no guarantee that a wildfire pool, separate from your fire coverage and homeowner's policy, would be any less expensive if you live in a high wildfire risk area. Go ahead. Thank you. And you could just raise your okay. hand if you want a question and we'll have staff come okay. in. Uh, I've got two related questions. One thing you said was there's no clear statewide standards for a fire resistance structure or mitigated property. I wonder how that compares to uh, CAL FIRES 4291. They come out and they do annual inspections and, and that type of thing. And I'm wondering what else, what else goes into that. And then you also mentioned a wildfire mitigated community. And I'm wondering, I've been involved in a number of fuel reduction efforts across the county. And are we talking fire-wise? Are we talking CAL FIRE? Are we talking fuel breaks? Um, what is meant by that? With regard to the, the statewide standard, there, there, are, there is the, uh, the 4291 and other CAL FIRE standards and other state standards, but there's no um, connection between if you mitigate according to those standards that the insurance company would be required to write you. And that's what's missing. The connection between creating standards at the state level and local level that all the stakeholders can agree to or, or force the insurance companies to write once those standards are met. And so that's really the key. And so there currently isn't the standard, whether it's the FireWise community standard, but we're looking at all those standards. And what we're trying to do is make that connection between when you do those standards, the insurance companies would then be required to write. Thank you, that's a really good answer. That's more than what I expected, that's really good. As far as a wildfire mitigated community, how about that? You know, it's really the same. You know, what we'd like to do is get, you know, all of the, you know, CAL FIRE and all the experts together with the insurance commissioner, the insurance companies, everybody together to determine what that, what that should look like. And as the commissioner mentioned earlier, it should also be somewhat flexible because every community has different needs and, and different situations and unique you know, geography, et cetera. So some statewide standard, but also the ability to be flexible in certain communities. It's not set, it's something that we would all need to get together to come up with. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I'll, I'll just read one of these questions. Actually follows a lot on the same lines. How specifically do insurance companies determine how properties are fire safe? And so to that point, of course, it varies from one insurer to the next today, right? We have maybe 50 insurers that write homeowners insurance in California, and each of them have distinct underwriting rules about what home they'll write and what home they won't write. Many of those con considerations are similar, but it is, it is up to the insurer and without a standard such as the commissioners mentioned and Tony was just talking about, an insurer just can pick and choose. So standards that they use include how far the home is from a fire hydrant, what the uh, fire protection rating is 
for your local fire department. So those go from a protection class one to a protection class 10, where there's limited fire response, fire department response, and at a one there's a significant, well-equipped, well-staffed um, response. So protection class is one. Type of roof is one. I mentioned um, wood shingle roofs. More and more companies are excluding homes or not refusing to write homes that have wood shingle roofs. So there's, there's any number of standards that insurers apply, fire line scores or core logic scores being among them, but a lot of times it is also as simple as distance from brush, difference, distance from a fire hydrant. Um, they may take into account whether a home is in a historic burn area as well. So there are many considerations and each company uh, determines its own set of standards in, in making its selection. Hi, yes, um, a couple of things. One, I learned earlier in discussions with your staff that there's no standard risk model that the state uses to say, if we were doing insurance, this is our risk mitigation, this is what we would compare everybody else's risk model to. And in hearing you, it doesn't seem like there's a connection between what CAL FIRE does in terms of fire risk areas and mitigation and all of those things and how it might drive, for example, rate setting. And I haven't heard anything about your use of data to, for example, compare the uh, cancellations, the non-renewals, et cetera, with the uh, actual fire events that have taken place. Is it geographically correlated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And more importantly, sometimes it seems that we're going to be paying collectively a lot more in higher insurance premiums that, than what it would have taken us to raise our firefighting taxes a little bit to equip ourselves a little bit better and then drive that fire rating number closer to one. Uh, we don't have information to help us make those decisions. How can the uh, commission help us locally to say, hey, look, you know, if you, if you all were able to get a little better fire protection, your ratings would go down from an average of four to uh, an average of one and a half. That reduces your insurance load by X, and you guys are ahead of the game. How can you help us do that? Well, with a couple things with regard to the last part of your question. Um, the protection class is a community-wide, you know, municipal-wide situation, and typically, your local fire department knows what their score is. Um, the ISO, the Insurance Services Office, is the entity that creates that one through 10 score for protection class, and they do have standards as to you know, what is a one, what is a two, et cetera. And so the community with the, with the local fire department would be able to look at that and see what am I missing to get down to a two or to a one, uh, or what is causing me to have a three or a four. Um, and so that's the way it would work. We, we, we're certainly willing to, to work with any community that, that is, has questions on that and needs a direct resource to get that information. Yeah, and there's another great part of your question about how much we spend post-catastrophe, right? And the commissioner pointed out $25 billion in losses. And I'm sure Cal Fire folks here would agree it's too bad we couldn't spend $25 billion in advance of any losses and avoided the chance altogether. And, and that's one where we really want to, you know, talk to our legislators about putting the money into prevention rather than, you know, trying to fix things after they're broken. It's way more expensive and, and really an unfortunate way to do business in a sense. So this is a, another written question that we have here that says, what can we, do to, uh, we, what can we do to have our insurance company come out and assess our home? We are not really in a fire zone, and we also have a fire hydrant on our parcel. Yeah, uh, you know, an insurance company that decides to non-renew you has to give you a very specific reason for the non-renewal. So if they've told you a reason that is vague, you know, I, I think you wanna do all you can to appeal to your company. So 
whether it's through an agent or directly, to say, are you evaluating my risk appropriately, right? It's a house that has a, a fire hydrant on the property is, uh, you know, has a leg up on, on protection. So it would make sense that that would be a home an insurer would keep. But, you know, they may have some other things with the property. But first, go to your company, see if you can reason with them to keep your coverage. And then there's that 800 number that the commissioner gave come to the department. If it's an unfair cancellation or they won't explain why they're non-renewing you, hopefully we might be able to help. So, Joel, we keep, we, we keep getting these reoccurring questions on insurance companies not coming out to assess the home. So what happens if, you know, nobody comes out to assess the home and then they get this fire scored? What do we do as a department? Yeah, there, you know, if we go to the company, there are several reasons you may be non-renewed, even unrelated to your particular home today. One of those is that insurers are trying to guard against an over-concentration of how many homes they've written in a given area. I know there was another question about being non-renewed just because you're in a particular zip code. Some insurers are looking at how much in total property values have, has this company written in this zip code and maybe we've overexposed our capacity so that they're trying to make sure that they haven't written too much to ruin their financial standing. Other companies underwrite, again, as the commissioner pointed out, based on a larger circumference of risk than your own property. And so in that case, um, you know, your property, they may already think is absolutely fine. But if you're 500 yards from a forest and they don't want to write that home because of that, that's why they may not come out to inspect your particular property. But again, you want to have that conversation with them to make sure whatever decision they're making is based on some realistic risk-based reasoning. So start with your insurer and then come to the department to make sure that what they're doing makes sense on a risk basis. We're gonna go back here and then we're gonna go to the front. Okay. Hi, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, in 2014, uh, we had, had an opportunity to uh, work with um, the experimental forest over in Tuolumne County, which is, which is similar to what you're talking about on the community um, planning. And so, um, so I uh, also um, brought forth to the Board of Supervisors a watershed management program which would reduce wildfire uh, by using our uh, natural resources here and also uh, an RCD, which is a perfect, um, um, which is a perfect management tool for that, and uh, and went to the state um, and a few other uh, agencies, and they, you know they just don't didn't seem to be interested, uh, and so I'm wondering when um, when we're going to get interested in those uh, sort, sorts of programs because it all relates to. Uh, the insurance ISO and wildfire risk and uh, you know you can dance around it all you want but um, that's the way it's going to be here until we get serious about doing the right thing. Cal Fire uh, does a really great job on what they do but it's usually trying to put something out. Uh, so you were talking about uh, putting money into prevention and putting money in after the fire like right now up in the Butte fire area I mean, it's not gonna burn for another five, six, seven years, right? Perfect place to have insurance if you ask me. But uh, we should do, uh, be putting programs together within the county, right now, county, uh, through the RCD, to be able to uh, have preventative maintenance going on so that we don't have that, that issue, same issue come up 10 years from now. And so that's where I think that we're gonna come. As far as the insurance goes, uh, <laughs> You know, those guys want to maximize their profits. They're not interested in us. Thank you.
Commissioner. Read a question here. Uh, can the insurance commissioner require that if an insurance company is licensed to sell other types of insurance, can they be re required to offer fire insurance also? Uh, years ago, um, we attempted to get insurance companies to be required to write auto insurance, um, especially if you were a good driver. And we didn't have the authority to, to require that, so we tried to get the law passed in the legislature, and we couldn't. It took a referendum, it took a proposition to require insurance companies to write good drivers. There currently is not an, uh, uh, an associated law for homeowners or fire insurance. And so without a law that would require it, um, we'd, we're in the same position, whether it would take a law by the legislature or a referendum of proposition to require insurance companies to write. And that is one of the proposals here is that if you do mitigate community-wide and home-wide, that the insurance company would be required to write your particular home. And that, that is our proposal. Uh, this last year, uh, the insurance, our insurance company bumped our uh, uh, required payments uh, 170 percent. What's going to stop them uh, next year of uh, bumping it again? Is there any legislation to prevent us from being uh, die from um, a thousand cuts? So one of the ideas, and I, I'll, I'll take a stab and make sure you guys can jump in. Uh, we're looking at once the department approves a rate increase, um, and that has been justified by our actuaries, that we put some sort of cooling off period, either a year, 12 months, um, or if the insurance company comes back, because I'll tell you what, what happens. Uh, we, they submit an uh, increase, and it is, it is justified actuarially. The minute that gets released, they submit another one immediately. And so what I've been thinking and talking to our staff is we need a cooling off period to see the, what the effect is on the non-renewals, uh, what is the effect on, on folks in a given area, and who's affected the most, uh, and or also create some sort of public hearing process by which then they have to, the insurance companies have to come before uh, and engage in a public hearing process so that they can justify it in that mean as well and give an opportunity for the public to weigh in as well and allow interveners to actually also weigh in. Uh, and we're looking at what can we do regulatorily to be able to say we're going to implement a cooling off period uh, or we're going to create and or create a public hearing process by which then companies can you know, plead their case. Uh, did I answer? Okay. I just want to ask one of the okay. written ones. Let's go to the written question because we were going one on one. This question deals with uh, what authority does the Department of Insurance have in requiring insurance companies to uh, mandate them to cover upgrade for building codes? Um, that is one of our proposals to make sure that every policy does have building code upgrade coverage. Um, th many companies won't, don't offer it and don't offer it in certain areas or don't offer it for certain age homes. And so our, uh, one of our proposals is to d require insurance companies to offer it. Uh, we found that after uh, many of the, the recent wildfires uh, that if you don't have it, obviously you're not going to be able to cover that extra cost of hardening your home and, and even covering just the generic building code upgrade coverage. But we also found that some people had a ten, usually a 10% of their, their coverage A as their building code upgrade coverage, which we found is not nearly enough, especially if you're rebuilding from scratch and you, you now have to put solar on your home and you have to put sprinklers and that sort of thing. You're going to eat that 10%. And so one of our additional proposals is to require insurance companies to offer uh, higher amounts than that 10% so that when you do have that situation, you're able to cover those costs. Just a question, um, and this may have been discussed, discussed before, but why can't the state just do a unified risk pool model? Throw earthquake in, throw flood, throw fire, throw everything into one big pool, and if somebody's gonna write insurance in the state, you, they compete based against 
a standardized risk model for the whole state. And it seems like it would, it would offer some stability with climate uncertainty, all the rest of this stuff. But I mean, just throw the entire state into one risk pool model and everybody competes against that model. I mean, it doesn't eliminate competition, but I mean, we have some areas are high fire prone, some are high flood prone, some are high, you know. Um, but I mean, just enforce an entire unified risk pool model that might eliminate so much of this stuff. One thing we have, as you're aware, is the FAIR plan. The FAIR plan is uh, for anybody that can't find fire insurance through the voluntary market. So the FAIR plan is, uh, you know, takes in any properties that can't get coverage elsewhere and ensures them based on the losses of the members of that fair plan pool. And um, you know we have comments tonight that the fair plan is quite expensive. So I mean you could argue that the pool for fire currently is the fair plan that you're competing against as a consumer, right, to find something better than the fair plan. But I, I don't think there's um, a guarantee, and I, I'm not saying it's a bad idea, it's just it would take some time, but there's no guarantee the pooling of people who have the highest fire risk, the ones that wouldn't necessarily be able to just get coverage in the voluntary market, who is in a voluntary market, obviously picking and choosing who they want to write, there's no guarantee that that pool would be anything but a high-cost, non-competitive pool. But, but it's also part of the conversations we're having. So, you know, we're yeah, I'm mean, just thinking. Is, yes, we're talking about fire here because it's a real. But right. I mean, what five, six years? It may be an earthquake issue. Right. So, but I mean, just may you know, just throw the state into an entire unified risk model. A catastrophe and, pool. Yeah. 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 Just to, just throw. And that way, the individual insurance companies compete against a same number. Correct. Okay, this is the number for this year that we're all going to compete against this number, so to speak. And, and this is why we're having these hearings because that's a great to, idea. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to go. One of the questions that we have here it says, "How does the term mitigated community apply to rural areas of a county with large parcels and public lands?" This is exactly why. Uh, we feel that once we come up with these mitigated standards, it's still got to be flexible enough to take in the unique characteristics of that specific community or county. Uh, but we at least want a baseline of what these mitigation standards would look like with input from the insurance industry to create that buy-in to keep them in the in in to keep them in our communities and for us to have more insurance carriers from the emitted market uh, as options. And so, again, understanding that not every single community is alike, but there is right now not even a minimum standard of what a community mitigations would look like uh, in the state. And that's exactly what we've been talking about. Question in the back. I know he had his hand raised for a while. Um, from, from watching your presentation and based on your answers here, um, the legislation can help us out with some of the insurance issues is what you said, correct? Also, also you said our local officials like me and the other supervisors in here can put forward ordinances and work with CAL FIRE for hazard reduction. My question is what do you do as a commissioner for insurance? How can you help us out with insurance? We know we were about hazard reduction. CAL FIRE has been out there putting in brakes, doing prescribed burns, they do as far as they can go. What do you do for us about the insurance as an insurance commissioner? So one of the slides that we had, well, we had actually several slides about what we're working on through our regulatory process uh, and the regulatory changes we're seeking within the department to be able to, one, give us the authority to mandate that insurance companies provide coverage for mitigated homes and hardened homes. We're also looking at, uh, uh, in terms of pushing the regulation of when it comes to creating the regulatory statutes of not only the time, that, the amount of time that we need for folks to be able to, to look for coverage, 
we're putting uh, on different tools that we, we now have to be able to collect the data that we need to be able to tell where this is happening. Uh, so there's a whole host of things that we were working on and we're gonna make the presentation, by the way, available to everybody and it's gonna be on our, online and I know there's a question about oh, can we email it, we will, which really detailedly tells you what the, the, the department is doing uh, to be able to uh, curtail some of the things that are happening. Yeah, I'll read a question here. Many people have coverage from non-California companies. What can the Department of Insurance do, if anything, to help with this? And the comment is, or subnote is, I had Lloyds of London, and uh, the uh, department said there's nothing that they could do when I think uh, Lloyds, I guess, uh, canceled their policy or had problems. So. Um, the surplus lines market, you know, there are a couple differences between the surplus lines market and what we call the voluntary market. Voluntary market has their rates approved, they're backed by the California Insurance Guarantee Fund, and they have to operate in a very consistent manner in terms of how they underwrite. That the department can enforce those rules because there are laws that apply. Actually, responding to your question, what does the department do? We, uh, we enforce the laws that your legislators put on the books. So that's why the commissioner is asking for more laws so we can help more. That's why we're here, to encourage you to help ask your legislators. But there are rules in terms for the voluntary market, in terms of what they have to do, surplus lines, there are fewer rules in terms of how they underwrite. They can choose really to write a home or not without those same standards. They do have to pay claims in accordance with their contract and in accordance with California law, but in terms of what risks they'll write or not write, they have much more discretion and you know, by virtue of being surplus lines and their rates aren't regulated. So their pricing is based on what the market will bear in many cases. So we always uh, encourage you to do everything you possibly can to go through every single admitted insurer to see if you can get coverage with an admitted insurer before you resort to either the fair plan or the surplus lines market. And I know a lot of you have tried hard to do that and you know maybe you've called more than one agent to try to get coverage but if you know one agent if your local agent absolutely can't help you you might have to try someone somewhere else you know those 50 companies that write coverage you want to make sure that you've contacted an agent ultimately that has represented every single one of those companies before you settle for a fair plan or surplus lines policy. And so where do they get that information on who's cover, what agents are covering? Yeah, so a um, couple well, ways. Well, a couple ways, if you, if you go onto our website, we have a list of all the 50 or 60 companies that are currently writing in the state. Doesn't mean they're writing in every area of the state, but that'll give you the list of the companies that are admitted, that are licensed in the state. We're also working on uh, enhancing our agent locator tool um, and once we do that, you'll be able to go into the, uh, your local area and look for agents. And then when you choose an agent, you'll be able to identify which insurance companies they write with. And so that's in process now. It'll be some time before we get that up and running, but that's, that's our next step in, when is the in getting more information. Uh, we're, we're hoping to get that done by the end of the year. Over here. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to tell a story that about a whole bunch of you guys have experienced this, but I got my renewal, non-renewal notice in September, and I uh, went to AAA, that was my care of 40 years, and they said, although my town is a two, the algorithm that they used, we were a nine. So there was no way they were gonna cover me. Now they gave me a wraparound and said I could go to the fair plan. So I went to the fair plan, we all calculated it out and everything. I haven't gotten it yet because I'm still calling a whole bunch of other agents, 
The local ones, is, they said, I can't do it without a fair plan. So when you say you've got 50 other people out there, I'm going to disagree with you, okay? And it's very frustrating and scared, right? So I just want to know if I went with the fair plan. This is the other issue, too, is that we follow Cal, Cal Fire, right, with our mitigation. The fair plan, I think, says you have to have 200 feet of clearance, which goes into our property, our neighbor's property and stuff. So is there two different things? Does the fair plan come out and look at your property and say what the rate will be, or you just get to get it? So, and well, how, how responsive are they after you uh, file a claim too? Because I've heard like up at the Butte Fire and at, up at Camp Fire, they had a hard time getting their money from the claims. So that's my question. Well, with regard to claims, certainly, you know, come to, you know, we encourage anyone who has an issue with any of the insurance companies on the claim side to come to us. We have some significant uh, authority in the, in the claims area, much more than we do on the, the underwriting area. Um, with regard to the, you know, the scores, you know, what, what it sounds like from, from your, what your statement is, is that you have a protection class score, but you also have a fire line score overlaid on top of that. And, and, and that is one of the concerns that we have, is that insurance companies, there's, there's no law that prevents them from doing that today, and that's why we'd like to change that, to, to require them to, um, number one, have their models be um, more accurate and include issues like mitigation, for example, that they currently don't include, but also giving us authority so that you can uh, you know, appeal your score and so that the, they're more accurate and so they're not, and if you do the mitigation that you'd be on the, home hardening side as well as the community that you'd then be able to get that coverage without being denied. Yeah, and uh, understood. Right. Understood. Right. So one thing right now, the fair plan can't turn you down if you don't have 200 feet of defensible space. The president of the plan just recently testified before the legislature and said we will write a home sitting by itself in the middle of the forest because if you can't get coverage with an admitted carrier the fair plan is obliged to write your home unless it's uninsurable meaning that it doesn't have a roof or nobody's lived in the property for a year doesn't have windows or doors but if your house is mitigated you know to, to the ability you have to do your property they cannot turn you down for a defensible space reason, and you should come to the department if that is an issue as I well. I think the problem too is also the affordability piece, right? They'll write you, they'll write you a, yes. a policy, but if it's not affordable, then it defeats the entire purpose, which is why we keep asking for, we want them to provide a comprehensive coverage that, you know, is not gonna force them to start buying on this wraparound that only exacerbates the cost, which is what we keep seeing and hearing from communities. Um, let's, we wanted one of the written questions? Sure, I'll go, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, are insurance companies required to disclose their underwriting criteria if requested by a homeowner? Uh, there, there currently are no laws that would require them to do that to a homeowner. However, um, if you did come to us and we opened a case, they'd be required to tell us the specific reason and we would have them tell you the specific reason so you would find out what that criteria is because we would make sure that they, number one, had criteria in place and properly and consistently applied that criteria and then we'd advise you of that. So if you are running into that situation, please contact us. Right. And if it's a non-renewal, they do have to give you the specific underwriting rule that they are using to non-renew your home. Any, go ahead. Well, we've been talking a lot about uh, residents, home, but what about businesses? I mean, we have a business that also has been canceled. And this is like, it's, it's amazing, it's terrible. If uh, people cannot insure their businesses, then businesses in California are gonna close. So then you guys are gonna really, really, really be affected. So what do we do in the meantime? And we, we have 45 days, not even a month to renew. Right. You imagine how long it takes to, we have a winery. So you imagine how long it takes just to fill up all the paper to find the right person. I mean, it's, you're giving us a lot of answer 
eventually. We're talking about now. <laughs> so what, what can we do? Can we just call you and you're gonna come and tell the insurance company you get to at least give an extension to those people? I mean, we're totally helpless. You know, it's like the big guys against us. And we don't really, I'm not getting really any answers from you guys. Well, this is why, this is why we're here. This is the first time we've done this. Uh, this is the first time the department has come out to, to actually listen and to have these discussions. And I understand the frustration of what can we do now? Uh, and, you know, since I've been in office for six months, we've decided, I wanted to come out and have these discussions because we've just, we haven't had an opportunity to have this dialogue in the past uh, for whatever reason. So this is exactly what we want to hear. Um, do we want to give the business perspective? But also, if they're not giving you 45-day notice, does that apply for businesses as well? So the, the, uh, no, the business, they have to give you more than 45 days notice. I think it's 60 for businesses. They also have, yeah, and the fair plan also writes businesses, just so you know, they do write, I think it's the still $1.5 million limit. For, no, it's, it's higher for businesses. For businesses, but the fair plan will write the property fire coverage of a business, and actually, if it fits on a business owner's policy, they will f write the liability. Um, I mean, the, we understand, we've been hearing through these um, meetings that businesses are having issues as well. You're located in the same type of wildfire risk. And of course, the town of Paradise had a lot of commercial businesses burn, as did uh, Santa Rosa area as well. So, you know, companies are, ex you know, evaluating their property exposure for commercial business as well. It, it is still, uh, again, more, more companies, I think, write uh, commercial risks than write homeowners business in California. So it, it, is, it is about a search for finding another insurer. I mean, that's, that's your first line of defense for anybody is to go from agent to agent to find someone, hopefully, that can help you. And but maybe, if they can't find it that way, can, they, can we, they call a department and we help them give well, them a list of individuals? We, we can tell them what insurers write commercial multi peril business or fire coverage. And uh, again, the fair plan will write coverage. Yeah, and, and our hope here is that a lot of the things we've been talking about, you know, in terms of mitigation and community mitigation will also help the businesses in the area too. Because if we're reducing the risk in general, then we're reducing the risk for those businesses also, and we're hoping that you know that will you know temper that problem. And with regard to the fair plan that was mentioned, uh, they do cover on the business side uh, liability coverage, and so in most cases you won't have to purchase a second policy if you did go through the fair plan. So take a look at that. It is more than the 1.5. I think it's three million, uh, and there's different. There's three. They have three different programs, but I encourage you to look at that to see if it's something that might meet your needs. And we can also help. So, one of the written questions. I'll ask one. Uh, why are manufactured and mobile homes having more difficulty getting insurance than stick-built homes? Uh, well, it's probably just as difficult, but I would say that there are less insurance companies that write mobile homes and manufactured homes, and so you have less options to find a, uh, you know insurance company that will insure you, so it, it's not so much that you're you're more risky. It's that there's less insurance companies that are out there. So if one or two of the major mobile home and manufactured home insurance companies uh, are, don't want to write, then you're 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 left with fewer options than in the traditional market. Well, can we just get somebody who hasn't asked a question? Just, uh, just to be fair, we'll get, to we'll, we'll get to you. Go ahead. Ma so, um, when we got our non-renewal notice, the reason was they don't insure in California. That was the reason. Um, I logged a complaint. Uh, they finally responded. And I, in, the, in the complaint, I said I would like somebody to come look at our property because we've done a lot to harden our house. We got finally a response back last week saying. Sorry, we're still not going to come out to your house because Lloyds of London no longer writes in California. 
We have called more than 10 agents. We have received zero calls back, so we're on the California Fair Plan. So my question is, next year, am I stuck on the California Fair Plan? Because there's nothing that you're providing me that's gonna give any of these insurance a reason to come and look at my house and insure me. So the bottom line is, once you're on the California Fair Plan, that's it, because nobody else is out there that responds to a phone call. Well, so first, I understand you called 10 agents and that, or more. Uh, you know, the point isn't necessarily how many agents you call, but what companies they represent. And so it's important to check off all 50 companies, and maybe you did that. A list from a real estate agent that said, when we sell houses, these are the companies that will insure in your area. I called every single one. Okay. Zero calls back. I, I appreciate that. And that may ultimately be the answer for many people. But I, I'm just saying the companies that may have written in your area may be the exact ones that don't want to write any more business in the area, right? They, they read, reach a concentration, and you want to find the ones that haven't written in your area Joel, but, is but what as, as she was saying, she said right. that Lloyd's is saying that they're not no longer writing in California as an excuse. Is that accurate? Well, I, I think we know that Lloyd's has written a lot of properties in California. I don't know that they're non-renewing them. It may be that they've hit I their have capacity. The letter from Lloyd's that says not insuring in California and it's locked on your website. I have it documented. Okay. Well, Lloyd's, of course, is one of many surplus lines insurers. And on our top 10 list of, of how to shop for coverage, there, uh, maybe you went to the Surplus Lines Association already. Their brokers represent multiple surplus lines well, carriers can, can as we, well. Can we, I mean, instead of like asking her, to, can, uh -huh. why, don't, why don't one of our staff members get her information and, and let's help her, okay. please? Okay, uh, we'll do one and then get to him. So we'll go ahead. I would like the contact person on your staff that would help me set up the pilot program for community hardening. Uh, I work very closely with Rotary. We're always looking for community service projects and we've talked about uh, going out and helping seniors harden their properties and I'd rather spend time doing things that are gonna be recognized and somehow fold it into right. that uh, than, than not. So who do I co coordinate with on your staff? Well, why don't we take your information down and we'll identify no, no, no. the right person. She's, she's in the back. Julia Juarez, who's the director of outreach, we'll make sure we follow up. So let's go to one of the hand rings. Oh, right here. cool, right there. First of all, I appreciate you guys being here, I really do. But it, as this guy said a while ago, we're dancing around the question. We're dancing around the issue. What you don't understand is there are no regular insurance carriers that will write fire in most of Calaveras County, period. I don't care how many you've got, 50, 200, 1,000, makes no difference. Nobody wants to be the only one writing coverage in, in areas that are have the wildfire. But worse than this is if you guys have the the ear of the legislature, talk to them. Get them to clean up our forests, get them to clean up all of the stuff. They have received block grants from the feds and they have used it for bullet trains that go start no place and go no place. They have used it for bringing people across the border. They have, you know, the, the, all these bleeding heart things that they've done and they have neglected the forest. And the forest is a tender box. If you drive over to Nevada, and look at the same exact forest, you could eat off the ground. Here is a mess. It's a giant mess. And it's because of misuse of funds from our legislature. They know it, the press knows it, but they're not gonna say anything about it because they're buddies with the, with the, with the legislator. They, but there are no, no companies up here that will write a standard homeowner policy, period. 
there are three or four other of us that are insurance brokers that are here, and I think we'll all tell you basically the same thing. Right? Right? You're missing the point. Call 50 of them. I don't care if there was 500 of them. Nobody is going to write. Nobody wants to be the only company that is going to write. They would be deluged with, comp with things that they really don't want to write. Talk to your legislature. Talk to your bosses and tell them, clean up the friggin' forest, and then we'll all be in much better shape. Get to the root of the problem, not just dance around the problem. So we, we agree with you with the fact that we need to provide more resources to tend to the forest. And the fact is that also the federal government has a responsibility that they've ensconced in terms of tending to their part of the forest. That's and right. so... The federal government gives California a block of money every, every year to do it. And they, they go other ways. So they... I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm saying we need to co better coordinate with the feds, local government, and the state legislature to tend and manage the forest. That is something that we all agree on. Uh, and we are having those conversations with the legislature. I don't know, Tony or Joel, do you have, do we have any, in terms of, because that's more of the other departments, but, but we, we agree with you. We need to get to managing the forest better and we need, it's all branches of government need to work together. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Again, thank you for being here. Sounds like to me the insurance companies have the upper hand. Because if they don't like what is legislated to them, they can just walk. Nothing. We've lost. There's nothing that they can do, or nothing we, as, as legislators or insurance commissions can do to give them what, you know, to do what they say. They want to they raise our rates, and it's getting ridiculous. Affordable. Nobody knows what the, the definition of affordable is, because affordable goes everywhere. Every step of one's making money. And my, my thing is, is I worry that the insurance companies can just flat ass walk out of here and not do anything. The law is not going to mean a thing to them. Well, this is why we're asking, this is why we want that authority to force insurance companies to cover, which we clearly don't have. And you're right. But there again, all they have to do is walk. They can walk. Yeah, I and think. We're stuck with nothing. One thing, uh, you know, of course, the, the FAIR plan, which I, I know people don't love to hear about the FAIR plan, but the FAIR plan is backed by the insurance industry in, in this regard. When they have big losses, it's the insurers that have to contribute to the FAIR plan. Insurers, if they choose only the very best business and all the higher risk business ends up in the FAIR plan, then the insurers are the reinsurer for all of that business. So that's their stake in the game. I, I agree, arguably, it isn't much. It's called a voluntary market in California, and insurers are free to come and go from this market. They get to charge higher prices when they have losses and non-renew if they want to write less risk so it really is about the legislation that is in place to regulate them, and these are the things we don't have the control over. There are a lot of things we do, and when people ask what the department does, you know, we help people with claims, we help keep the rates in accordance with insurers' losses, but yes, insurers have a lot of freedom in the state. I'll, I'll just add that, it, you know, you're right. Insurance companies, if, if we pass certain laws that they don't like, theoretically, they can walk. But, I mean, this is a, a big market. It's the fifth largest, you know, insurance market in the world. Um, many of them make money. Um, they don't want to leave this market. If some do, then, you know, that's, that could happen. But it, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't act, right? I mean, we, we still need to move in the direction that we're moving in to make things better. And if there are a few insurance companies that do decide to leave, then we just have to deal with that. One more thing. It's just the same as like with health insurance. 
That's another bone of contention. I've always felt that health insurance is nothing but man's inhumanity to man because they have control over us. They say you can't put a price on life. Well, brother, they have. They have. They found a way. But just like anything else, anything that involves insurance, whether it be auto, whatever it be. But uh, thank you for uh, being here, and I appreciate Thank you for your comments. Your thank you. Want to go to... Okay, I, I have a written question here. Uh, so you're saying each home can have its own class and not by area. It's been area by class 10 and above. You can't get insurance. Who determines the class? So um, I, I guess back to the, you know, the general underwriting question is that insurers can have several factors that apply to the individual home, the age of the home and the construction and um, you know, number of years you've been there, whether what your claim history is. There are a lot of individual components that go into underwriting as well as general components such as the protection class, the type of fire department you have, and the wildfire risk score. So they, they all are really at the choice of the insurer. This is a voluntary market. You know, we, we don't come here to defend insurers. We come here to just explain the laws that are in place or the lack of protections that you might have. That's why we are encouraging you to go to your legislators, right? You are their bosses, that is what is why they are, have their jobs, they're not our bosses, but they set the rules that we get to enforce. And right now, generally, insurers do choose all of their underwriting standards, which is why the commissioner is pressing to have at least certain mandates that if a home did this, an insurer would have to write it because there is no such law today. And those are the things that we're hoping you will ask your legislators to impose on the that, insurance industry. Is, but we're, also, we're also taking that, this information from these town halls right. to the legislators, and we're having these conversations with them as we continue to, to meet and try to figure out how we come up with these solutions. So this is the purpose also of these, of these town halls. Yeah. Uh, another question. Are our insurance companies opposed to the legislation that would improve the California Fair Plan to compete with insurance companies? Yes. And, you know, and that's one of the, you know, the hurdles that we have here is that um, we can propose some reasonable um, changes to the Fair Plan, and we have some authority in that area, but th the insurance industry also has some uh, leverage at the legislature. And so... But we have, but, but Tony, the, I mean... The conversations we've been having is um, we're looking within our authority to make these changes within the fair plan and we're prepared i'm prepared as a commissioner to to go to court and seek these changes if we have to uh, because it, it's it's unfathomable to assume that this is actually a fair plan when it's not affordable and it's not providing comprehensive coverage and so uh, we're prepared to do that as well we're planning to do that I'll read a question here. With the PG&E lawsuits for cause, will the insurance companies get any reimbursements? And I think the expectation is that if PG&E stays solvent or whatever happens there, there will be some level of reimbursement to insurers. That is something they typically get eventually through litigation. Um, there have been such um, reimbursements in the past, I guess, um, when there were utility-caused wildfires, but those, those reimbursements come many years later, typically, and are at a percentage of the insurer's actual losses. 
at that point in time, the insurer's rates are adjusted to reflect their loss history at that point in time. But until that actually happens, the, their loss history reflects the current loss levels. Just a piece of how rate making works. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming and visiting our community. Um, you mentioned that the governor has a bill on his desk that would extend the notification time. If he signs that, when does that go into effect? That was going to effect January. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we would. We the bill would have gotten. I don't think it's an urgency bill. Yeah, it will take effect in January. Okay, I, I have one here. Twenty-five billion dollars in losses in 2017, 2018. How does that compare to their revenue and income? We did address that a little bit earlier. Um, uh, there, so in, in 2017, I mentioned they had a 200% loss ratio, meaning they paid out $2 for every dollar that they took in without regard to their expenses or anything else. They paid that out in claims. Um, obviously, they had other expenses and such at the time. And 2018 followed up uh, with a similar year, 170% loss ratio for homeowners insurance, but actually an even higher loss ratio for companies that just write standalone fire coverage. So they were they're by far the massive worst losses in the insurers had had since the fire in Oakland Hills in 1991, which might have caused something just over 100%. So those was well beyond that. So you'll hear insurers say that's wiped out their profits for 20 years. Uh, if, but that's true if you don't count their investment income they've had. They have many years where insurers operate homeowners at around a 50% loss ratio, meaning they pay out 50 cents on the dollar but are, in theory, saving money for catastrophes. So they did have reserves, and they buy reinsurance to pay for catastrophes, but those were record-breaking years in every way. And the question is, you know, that insurers are balancing, we all balance, is that what next year will look like, or were those anomalies, and that things should go back to the way they were you know, in 2010 or 12. And um, so their losses are saying this is what's likely to happen. 2015, a bad year. 2016, okay. 17, awful. 2018, awful. So that's how their books look. We're hoping to turn that around. And actually, we're grateful for some rain. I hope that came up here this morning to start an early year. but. We hope that we can turn that around um, in terms of the mitigation in advance so that they won't have those bad of years and their rates will follow their loss ratios on a down, downward slope. That's the, that's the hope. So we have a, go ahead. Hi. In regards to the California Fair Plan, um, in my situation, um, I've been quoted, my insurance has tripled. And um, through the process, there's no guarantees that they'll still give it to me. They said if it doesn't go through, then I'd get the California Fair, Fair Plan. And that is required to pay in full up front, in which I'm two weeks away from my 40 days being up. So how is that fair? And is that true, that when you are on the Fair Plan, it, you don't know what the rates are, and you're required to pay it all up front. Well, well, first of all, you should know what the rate and the premium is going to be. And, and, but we would agree they currently don't have a, a monthly payment program, and that is one of the, the requests that Commissioner Lara has made to Fair Plan 
and we're hoping in the next few weeks to have an answer that they're going to go to a monthly payment plan specifically to address those reasons because right now the best payment option they have is a 40 percent down and three subsequent payments and with the large increases we're seeing and in the premiums especially in these areas we believe that could be completely unfair and so we've asked them to separate them into 12 monthly payments and to, and also uh, look at allowing uh, credit card payments which they currently don't allow uh, so to at least give people some options and and being able to spread out those payments over 12 months. And so what's the status of, of the... Well, we're, we're waiting for an answer from them, and, and we received a positive response in that they're, they're, they're looking at the issue and they think they can do it. Now we're just looking to see when they can do it. Thank you. I want to... Wow. <laughs> it's not my normal sound system in here. Uh, I want to thank the insurance commissioner very much for coming up tonight all the way to Calaveras County. Um, his staff is going to stick around for a few minutes. They're in the back of the room, the people in the blue shirts. If you have specific questions, please, please talk to them. I'd like to make a special thank you to Tony and Ed Lark from the county office who helped coordinate this and videotape this. Tony, thank you especially, short notice, putting this all together. But again, Insurance Commissioner, thank you very much. Um, we've got a lot of issues up here around insurance, and our community moves forward with insurance, and we all need it. So we appreciate the work that you've done on this, and uh, you're always welcome back in Calaveras. Frog Jump is always a great place to come visit us again. Thank you guys very, very much, and have a safe evening. Drive home.